Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's episode of The Formula. I'm your host, Trevor Carlson. On The Formula, we break down and explore the elements of achievement in world-class performers. This week's guest is Clipisode's Brian Alvey. Brian is a startup veteran out of Silicon Valley. He's, a, he's been a frequent guest on Jason Kalkanis's This Week in Startups, Uh, The first time I heard of Brian, I was at South by Southwest last year, and I sat in on a live podcast that featured Jason and Brian giving feedback to startups as they pitched their idea and really talked about, you know, the opportunity with investing in their company. Uh, It was it was really fun watching those two critique uh, those startups. And then uh, more recently, Brian and I actually uh, were introduced in a startup group that we're both a member of. I, uh, I requested that Brian be a guest on the show after having a quick conversation with him, and I was really glad that I did. We, we had a really good conversation just about the ups and downs of being a startup founder, different pieces of advice that he has for people at different points in their career, and we even used Clipisode to source some of the questions uh, from, from some of our listeners that we asked Brian. So without me rambling on any further, let's get right to the show with Clipisode founder, Brian Aldi. What is one piece of advice that you would have for new startup founders who are just kicking off their startup today? That's a very open-ended question. Like people ask you, what's the best book? Give me the best business book, right? And it's funny because I've been hit by that on stage before and it's it's kind of crushing. You're like, oh God, that, there's like, I can think of 99. And then you can't remember the titles, right? It's really a pain. And what I've realized is it's it's whatever book like fits your situation. You have a problem right now. You have a thing that's stopping you, an obstacle. You need to get around something. You need to you need a breakthrough. No one book is going to cause that breakthrough for every single person I answer that question for. So back to your question. What's like a great piece of advice for a new startup founders? There aren't that many one size fits all, you know, pieces of advice. Some people shouldn't be founders. You can't tell that to everybody, right? Like quit just stop. Right? <laughs> uh, and you can't say, you know, and, and on the flip side, you can't say persevere no matter what, keep going, no matter what everybody tells you, because really some things shouldn't be built. Some things should not be done. Some people should not be doing the things that they're doing. But um, if I had to pick one, it's, uh, I would say play to your strengths because you're going to, let's say you're jumping into being an entrepreneur or working at a startup for the first time ever. You're going to have skills. You're going to have a background. You're going to have something that makes you better than other people. And it's probably not what what you were hired for, right? So if you're trying to get into, I don't know, project manage, you know, building a site or an app or something like that, um, you have some skills from somewhere. You were, I don't know, a tennis champion or you're great at putting up with, you know, mean people. Like there's some skill, some superpower that you have that's probably nutty. And uh, let's say you were, I don't know, selling shoes at the mall probably you should get on the sales team and see Mm -hmm. about closing deals and getting sponsorships and things like that. Take that one thing that you have, that skill you have from some other arena and lean into that the minute you get into running your own company or working in a startup because you're going to go further if you double down on your strengths. So that's what I would say. I would say find that one thing that you're special at and really play it up and you can backfill the other stuff later on. So that's maybe the most universal thing I could say. Man, that, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Like one, one question I have from something you said earlier was you said maybe some people shouldn't be founders. How, how do you, hmm. <laughs> I want to say, how do you know if you should be a founder or not? But I don't know if, I don't know if a lot of people that are considering being founders maybe have, I mean, I don't know if I would have had that level of self-awareness when I started my first business, Right. but how, there's no good, there's, yeah, you can't tell. There's no good answer. It's like, how can you tell what's going to be a, like a billion dollar business? And until it's sold for a billion dollars, you just don't know. I mean, the the guys who built Fab have created like billion dollar businesses multiple times to see them like implode to be fifteen million dollar businesses, right? So you got to wait until the money's in the bank, and then you know if you could do it, right? It's it's like a I don't know. There aren't that many things that you can walk into going, you know, I know I can beat everybody in the world to get this gold medal at this Olympics, 
right? It's very hard to say that. So until you've done it, nobody should tell you you can't try. You should try. But, uh, you know, I, it's, it's a really tough question. So, so that's, you know, like I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's kind of unanswerable, right? How mm -hmm. can you, like, this is what um, in angel investing, they talk about this all the time, which is every, every billion dollar idea, every amazing new thing that changes the world looks stupid and crazy. And that's why the Innovator's Dilemma book exists, which is all those stupid things that end up eating, you know, Nokia's business, right? And, and putting BlackBerry out of business, right? The iPhone, it's like, it's preposterous at the time. Like it can't be done. I mean, there were people, and this is one of my favorite stories ever, is there were people like cheering when the iPhone was announced because they thought Steve Jobs is going to jail. There's just no way this thing he announced. And this is like, this is a guy sitting on a, you know, multi hundred billion dollar company or whatever, right? Or, you know, it was going to be a yeah. $100 billion company and, you know, maybe the first one to a trillion. And they were like, wow, the guy just got up and lied. He's going to be carried away in handcuffs in like half a year, a year when they don't actually produce this thing because it's impossible to make a full touchscreen the size of your hand that lasts all day long because you can't, you can't fit a battery in there. And then the joke was it's just a giant battery with a small touchscreen on it. <laughs> and they did build it and nobody ever thought about doing it that way. So, you know. Who are you to say that you know every single thing that sounds like it's completely stupid is is every startup right on day one they all sound just completely stupid otherwise ibm would have done this already microsoft would have done this already facebook would be doing this so you have to come up with that thing and at the beginning you cannot distinguish the winners from the losers the completely stupid things from the completely amazing things and you don't know until the history has been written so you know i, I just look at it like I will never tell somebody else that they shouldn't be a founder, you know, that they shouldn't start their own company. I will never begrudge them that. It's very funny. Um, I have these really good friends in New York. They work at a giant media company and like a, the, they're like super talented, creative people. And their um, their admin, their assistant left. Like I was writing her. I'm like, hey, I want to meet with my buddies. Like, can we schedule some time? And I get a thing back. You know, she's gone, not at the company anymore. And I asked them and they were like, we love her, but she had this idea. And she watched us execute our idea. Who are we to tell her she can't go off and do that, that she can't go off and start her own company? Like more power to her, you know? Like it's really hard for people to do this. So when they do it, you can't say, no, no, stay and keep doing my scheduling and my calendar and, you know, you know, helping me plan my lunches. Like, <laughs> right. That's just idiotic, right? Like you can't, so let them do it. But, uh, you know, I don't know, man. I've seen a lot of people fail, fail, fail and still get funded. And I scratch my head going, really how are they still getting funded like isn't it clear <laughs> these people shouldn't be doing what they're doing and then who knows maybe the third fourth time you know like i, I have friends that will bet on always bet on people that they've that, that have failed because they figure you, you know it's like baseball you 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 fail two times and you you hit it once okay you're batting 333 that's like hall of fame level right batting average so you got to give them that third shot so i don't know i, I begrudge no one you know I'm, I'm thrilled when people are trying this and you know, the, you know, here's the funniest thing. I would tell you the things that I thought were completely dumb in terms of startup ideas go on to be huge. You know, I think not that I thought Twitter was dumb. You know, everybody's kind of jokes about, you know, what are you having for lunch, that kind of thing. But I'll tell you YouTube. YouTube was one where I was watching them do this thing. They, they literally took what's the most expensive thing that you can do online? Um, serve video, right? Like if you're running a platform, like serving video is clearly a thousand X times, you know, serving up little like WordPress pages or whatever, or, you know, text and, you know, whatever, anything else or photos. Video is like, it's just stupid expensive. Very expensive. So they, they were spending millions of dollars a month to host the world's videos for free. So their, their business was, you give me this really, really giant file or all your stuff off your cameras and put these things online and we'll just host them for free. Like that was their business. Okay, it's like the dumbest thing ever. It's like just taking a truck of money to a cliff every week and just like pitchforks and shovels, just shoveling it <laughs> just, off the cliff. Just, just burning it. it. <laughs> just burning it, just watching it spread off into the into the canyon. Like not even to be retrieved. Like nobody can go down there and get it. It's just gone. And you're like, well, that's clearly like would you would you have put ten grand into that company in one of their early rounds? Would you have put a hundred grand into that company? Like, would you have written them a check to keep you know, they're burning through millions a month. Would you want to be next month's couple million dollars that just goes Tough in call. And just disappears? Horrible call. Terrible. Until they exit and like, wow, it's genius. And then, hell, they exited too soon. They were bought for $1.6 billion and they are arguably worth $100 billion plus 
inside of Google. That's a lot. Oof. <laughs> right? So anyway, really stupid idea. I would totally bet against them. And, uh, you know, there you go. Right. So there's there's a couple things. Is like one, uh, I feel like I hear a lot of people say things like, well, your idea is bad. We need to help you like make your idea better. And I'm always mm-hmm. like, well, you know, maybe they have a different perception of the world that you don't have that makes them like uniquely qualified to do this. Like, right, right. Absolutely that. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And then the other thing is too is like I, I think when I was younger I'd be like, well, I, I've, got, I've gone back and forth on this. I mean I'm only 29, so when I say younger mm-hmm. I mean like 21, 22, um, where, uh, where it's like, okay, well – at first I was like, everybody should start a startup. It's, it's so much fun and all this stuff. And then, and then I was like, wait, maybe not everyone needs to start a startup. Maybe less people should. Mm. And now I'm kind of like, well, I've, I've almost like gone uh, more towards the middle where I'm like, well, the experience that you have when you start something or try to build something new, even if it doesn't work, it, changes the way it changes your perception on a lot of things plus you develop like all these new skills and connections and all this stuff that you didn't have before right i have a friend who just said something kind of profound on facebook which was if i hadn't been an entrepreneur i wouldn't know one that i don't want to be an entrepreneur and then two what kind of company i fit in well at so he kind of learned from his own trying and failing what he's good at, what he's not good at. He really learned a lot about himself. He's very like self-reflective, kind of like a monk these days. Right? <laughs> right. Advice, right? You know, but he failed. And uh, but he knows like there are certain kinds of companies that he does he is not a fit for, and there are certain kinds of ones that he can totally totally understand. And uh, you know, going back to that thing about you know failing twice and then succeeding the third time, and you know, I, I've I've you know a lot of angel investor friends, and they'll say like, when you shut your company down. If you tried every single thing you could try and you're insane enough and uh, masochistic enough to get up there a third time and try the same thing and ruin another, you know, marriage and, you know, Ugh. scare away all your friends and, you know, just like physically put yourself through the ringer, right? Be lonely, be depressed, have the 3 a.m. panic attacks, run out of money, go without salary for a year. I mean, this is all the glory days of like startups, right? Mm-hmm. If you're willing to do that, you know, I'm going to be your first check, that third company, that fourth company that you do. And if you think about it, um, we had uh, I had a really good uh, elementary school teacher for my kids back in New York. And a lot of the parents would complain they didn't want kids bringing video games and phones and DSs and things like that to school. And part of it was the, well, my kids are, it, it creates like that jealousy thing, like who has the best sneakers, who has the best, you know, Game Boy, whatever the, whatever the, the game was they were playing. And so that is a pain. I get that. Your kid comes home every day like, can I have the new iPhone? Can I have the new this? You know? And so they just, they didn't want to tell their kids no, so they wanted the school to outlaw this so they wouldn't have this problem. And he said, no, I want them to play video games. I encourage them to play video games. One, it's a social thing for a lot of kids that aren't maybe social without that. They'll sit and play games with their friends that they might not do otherwise. They don't just go up and talk to people. They don't have those skills yet, and they'll learn these skills from that. But here's the number one thing. I want them to fail. I want them to learn that just because the first time you do a, uh, like a math test or a placement test, you get a bad grade. That like puts you on the bad track for life. That's the way education system works. But he loved video game learning, and he loved the science behind it. And he sent me like TED Talks links and books and things. Super, super smart guy. And it was all about the fact that video game – learning works more like real life learning which is you start you play the play level one and really if it's too easy you're not gonna play that game again it's kind of stupid but if you if you die quickly and then you try it again and you die a little further then you try it again and you like die and then you try it again and you beat the level wow you just learned something you learn from failure you learn from adversity you learn from losing and then you 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 overcome that stuff if you just win 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 all your life you really learn nothing. Yeah. So back to startups, right? It's that video game mentality. If I can go out, try to raise money, fail, just make it, fail again, completely fail, start again, you're going to be armed with a bunch of skills. You're going to have this awareness that you're not going to learn in a business school class, that you're not going to learn in a textbook. And you're going to learn from real life experiences and those hardships and that pain in your gut that hopefully turns back into a fire to keep you going the next time. Yeah, I, oh man, that's uh, I never thought about startups as a video game <laughs> before, but now that you mention it, it's 
you know, there is a lot of, of that because it's like even on a daily basis, you have like little obstacles or little things that you have to overcome. And the first couple times they pop up, you're like, oh, my God, my business is going to fail tomorrow if I don't fix this thing. But then after it's come up a few times, you're like, oh, this is just normal. This is my job actually is right. to <laughs> solve these problems. Yeah, it's well. And so so the, the biggest trait, you know, is resiliency. And people will talk about looking for people who are resilient, people who can deal with that failure. And, you know, when I said before that there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of loneliness in starting a company, um, it's it's a, it's really it's a real thing because you're you're going through this thing that I get it, you know, startups are big right now and Shark Tank and angel investing and mm-hmm. you know all these things, right? Like startup culture, right? It's it's you know everybody's talking about valuations and, you know, uh, term sheets and whatever. And a lot but of jargon. <laughs> tons of jargon, right? There's tons of jargon. But there's still it's not like 95% of the people on earth have started a startup. It's got to be less than 5%. It's not a lot of people, right? It's 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 a small percentage of people. So it's a it's a an interesting job because it's so poorly defined and then it's also a very lonely job because you just can't tell everybody what you're going through and so so i I know you know one of the questions you get asked all the time and stuff like this is like what's your biggest failure you know what you learn from it it's like really i had like nine failures today i don't remember the last time i had a win you know and you got to keep a brave face right it's pretty it's pretty crazy so i i fail i fail at things all the time um i completely understand those kids who um you know do an instagram post or not I mean, probably more Instagram than anything where they put something up and if it didn't get like 10 likes in the, in the first few minutes, they delete it. They take it back down. They, mm-hmm. they rework it. They put in different hashtags. Then they, they put it up again and they wait until it gets like those 30, 40, 50 and it like catches fire. Right. I understand like that putting yourself out there and I send, I can't tell you how many emails I send to get like one thing. And it looks like, Oh, you signed up this advisor. This person's using your product now. Oh, you get these investors. You just spend your day winning, don't you? Like you only see the part where I spend my day winning. I don't really talk about the ninety percent of the time where I'm, oh getting, yeah, you know, getting myself kicked and not winning. And it goes back to that whole Facebook thing. You know, you're, you know, everybody sits there lamenting about somebody else's Facebook and Instagram because they're comparing their reality, their horrible day, to somebody else's best possible photo out of thirty that they took while you know things were on fire and their kids are screaming or whatever and it looks like they have their stuff together but they don't so don't compare your reality to somebody else's you know fake reality or you know, <laughs> right. shot you know it's, it's a tough thing how do you how do you keep going or how do you stay resilient when you know like you were talking about the video game as you are i mean i'm just gonna use it as an, an analogy moving forward because it seems to make a lot of sense so you're in the middle of the game or the startup and you you're constantly running into obstacles and you're not making progress at that moment in time. How do you keep, how do you keep going or how do you, how do you know when you should keep going? Yeah. So it's like that little dopamine thing, right? Where, where the reason you put that Instagram picture up is every time you get a like, you get an alert on your phone. You're like, Oh, somebody liked my picture or, Oh, that brand that I mentioned or that celebrity I mentioned actually liked the thing that I said about them. How cool is that? Right. And it just, you just need a little bit to keep you going. So having a good support system, have a family and having a family and a wife that like, you know, like are always like, you're going to make it. This is going to be big watching other people win. So, you know, working on a, uh, like a social video startup while watching musically, which I didn't really think was going anywhere. You know, like I know a lot of people who were into it and like not into it anymore. Kind of like the same way a lot of people were in a Snapchat and they're not anymore. So you think, Oh, that's a ghost town now. And then they sell for a billion dollars and you're like, Oh, okay, good. I can keep going, right? You take it where you can get it. You take those little, those little sparks and you just, you just take those little dopamine hits and those little signs that, you know, maybe it's not all for nothing and you just roll with it. You have, you know, for those 20 emails I send out, I'm telling you, like, it seems like I, I, I just spend days meeting with like TV stars and rock star investors and, you know, talented people and like, ah, oh, just, and I, I'm on Twitter all the time and like, this just must be great. And, and, and that you don't see the 19, you know, ghosts that I get, you know, like non replies, like nothing at all. Like you pour your heart out to an email and you try to keep it concise and reach out. And then I reach out to this like one voice actor and he writes me back and we have like a two hour dinner and I'm like, oh, this just it's that it's the one in twenty. It it looks like my average is better than that, but it's not. And you've got to hold on to those ones that work. You go, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I have the person you know and I also believe a lot in um like I don't know what the right word for it is like kismet or fate or whatever, but um you know, like when I'm trying to hire somebody for a role, 
I know that I'm missing out on people who maybe aren't open to the opportunity right now, but I don't worry about that. I just worry about out of the pool that's there right now, what was the right thing to come along? Same thing with investors. Yeah, I get told no all day long. I get, I get told hundreds more no's or hundreds of times more no's than, than yeses, right? But the yeses are some of the most famous investors ever. And I feel really good, like that helps. But it took, you know, 99, and people talk, you know, like nine no's to get a yes. It feels like 99 no's to get a yes. So you just take it where you get it and you hold on to what you can. And then you just, you just don't stop. Like you don't know which email is going to be the breakthrough. I think the guy who started um, Box, no, uh, it was, so I don't think it was Aaron Levy who did Box. Oh, it was, it was the Evernote guy, um, Phil. He was like struggling with his service. People weren't really using it or whatever. And then finally he gets this one note from this one customer like late at night asking a question about something. And the guy turned out to be an investor too and then invests in his company. And like, he just had to keep going and wait for that little, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And then from the, from there, it caught fire. He built a giant company. You know, he was really successful. But man, you got to just keep waiting for that thing. Um, and, and I don't know how to tell you when to stop because I'm, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I do understand that some investors will actually take it as a sign that there's something wrong with you if you won't stop working on an idea that's clearly a loser. But I don't know how you define what clearly a loser is. That's tough because it's, uh, I've been on both sides of that, both sides of that table where, you know, things are clearly not going well, but you're like, man, am I, am I just like, am I just in the dip right now when I'm, and I'm just so right. close to getting out of it or, or am I just drinking my own Kool-Aid? Right. And yeah, it, it's, it's really tough. And there is no difference while you're doing it, whichever one you're doing, there's no difference be between the daily routines of drinking your own Kool-Aid when you're totally wrong going off a cliff and drinking your own Kool-Aid when you need that to keep yourself going to have your bill and dollar exit or whatever, you're, whatever it's going to be. Yeah, and maybe it could just be that means you need to be much more careful about the things that you get involved in because if you're the type of person that's going to, you know, like you're the type of captain that's going to go down with your ship, maybe you need to be very selective on the types of startups you get involved with. No, absolutely. So there are definitely ways to optimize. And there, you know, and watching a lot of angel investors do what they do, there are ways that they weed out things that are, you know, probably not going to work. So, you know, for a long time angel investing was you sketch out something on a napkin at a coffee shop and the angel investors like, "Yeah, here's some money. Go build that." Right? And then nowadays, angel investors are like, "I'm not going to write those checks anymore." You know, I know that 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 the odds of if I meet a hundred people who do napkin sketches and they have a great idea and they just need a team to build it and they just need my check to be the thing that gets them to quit their job or work on this at nights and weekends or whatever, you know, like stop going to bowling or whatever it is they do and like and watching Game of Thrones and like they do this instead, right? If if my check is the difference between that, I'm pretty sure like I'm never gonna find the winners in that pool. So let me move upstream a little bit. And let's say I don't meet with the napkin sketch people anymore, and I only meet with the founder once she's built something, he's built something, right? And they've got something they can show me. Now, I'm only looking at the stripe of people who have proven to me that they can build something and that they can build something without my check. Well, well, that's a great sign. Like, let's, let's, let's look at that cohort, right? And only now invest into that camp. Then, once you're doing that for a while, the smart thing to do is move upstream again and say, that's great. Um, that's amazing that you can build something. Lots of people can build things. I can build an app. You can build an app. I can build a you know, payment service. You can build a payment service. Like there's all these APIs, right? You can have in a hackathon, you can build like nearly any startup that exists right now, given 48 hours and a bunch of libraries and APIs. Like you can kind of build Pinterest or, you know, like whatever you want to build, right? So, okay, great. Now let's move upstream a little bit more. Let's find somebody who can convince somebody to leave their job before they have funding. Let's find somebody who is smart enough to partner up with a sales co-founder instead of just a tech co-founder. And everybody wants a tech co-founder, and I want to see somebody who will partner with a sales co-founder, somebody who has a Rolodex of 100 businesses who bought a product like this before, who is going to open the door to revenue and, and take them down the path to sustainability, to profitability. Like, how about that? So, so you get to be kind of more selective at looking at that. So there are ways to, you know, if you look back, you say, well, well, wait, what if, what, what if one of those napkin sketch uh, founders had actually invented the next, you know, 
Twitter or Apple or who knows what, te Tesla, right? Something. Well, that's probably true, but I have friends who invented um, Seamless, you know, the food delivery service, and um, like, and we just make fun of them. We're like, yeah, I get it. You invented Seamless, but <laughs> you didn't build it. They did, and your idea is worth nothing, and the napkin sketch is worth nothing, and who else, who didn't sit in their office at 9 o'clock at night in New York City and go, God, I wish there was a way where I could just go to a website and just order food, but not always from the same damn thing that I have every night, but like, let me get something that's like, I don't know, let's get Mexican tonight, or let's go get this fresh place across the street or whatever, right? right? Thai food. That doesn't mean you, you know, it's, it's like the line in the Facebook movie. Like, if you had invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook, right? Same thing. If you had invented Seamless, you would have invented Seamless. So the napkin sketch people, like, I, I have no problem ruling out those hundred founders and saying, nope, don't even want to talk to you about it. Like, or I'll talk to you about it, but I'm certainly not going to write you a check. I'm certainly not going to waste an hour with you. Uh, for a napkin sketch, are you kidding me, right? So there are ways to maybe eliminate a lot of the people who will become your perpetual, I just need another check so I can build the rest of my prototype, right? Yeah. And I need another yeah. check because it ran out and here's the reason why I like excuses. Like you don't wanna be stuck in that, you wanna be stuck in the people who actually have a couple customers and need your help more upstream. So I don't know how we got on angel investing. <laughs> no, it's good. And which it actually kind of segues into another question I wanted to ask you, which was, let's say you're one of the napkin guys, right? You have your idea and you want to like turn it into an actual startup. Like if you were to, if you were to start something brand new today with your idea on a napkin, how would you, how would you get started? So, and I mean, I'd love to say, you know, like, well, it depends on what the idea is, but, but let's say it's, you know, the thing I'm doing now or whatever. Um, it also depends on your life situation, right? If you've just exited your last business and you were a founder and you, you're sitting on a big pile of money, you know, you're in a different situation than somebody who is still paying off a student loan and, you know, is working at a company and in, in a major city where rent is really expensive, right? And it's, it's a little harder, you know, or it just comes from a different life experience, right? Um, so, so it kind of depends on where you're starting, what you're able to do. I mean, the, the, not the joke, but like the, the thing is like if, if Ev Williams or uh, Mark Pankus or one of these people comes to you and they say, hey, I've got an idea, you know, for their napkin sketch, you write the check, right? If, you know, the, the people who built Zynga and, you know, Medium and Twitter and all these things, right? Like they're probably, you know, or Elon Musk, right? He goes, I have a napkin sketch for a, another rocket company or, or to, you know, to build tunnels. You're like, great, here's my check. I know I'm going to see that money again. And a lot of it's friends like that money is going to come back in a giant money party and it's going to be cool. So that's, that's a different case, right? So it depends on your life experience, where you're coming from, but a after qualifying that. So when you're going to start something, you, what you're always doing is, um, you know, when like Jackie Chan would be in an alleyway and he would have <laughs> to get to the top of the building, yep. he'd, like jump to one wall and then go up the, 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 you know, the fire escape and then you do like a pull up and a flip and then jump back to the other wall. And you're like, kind of halfway or in a corner between two buildings, right? And you're just like doing this weird little zigzag dance up the thing. That's all this is. You have to fake it on one side and show that you kind of have enough of a product for a great demo to then go over and win some investor money. And then once you do that, you have to take that on, on, the, on, on that side and like ride that up a little bit and go back and tell your team, like, we got this money, come join me, right? And then you have to go back now and build and show enough that you can impress them to then like get the next little round of funding. So you have this weird sort of, and then you go to the customers and you say, hey, I have this thing, it does this amazing stuff. I have a, a thousands of dollars solution that solves a million dollar problem. And you have to convince them, does your thousands of dollars solution exist yet? Is it, does it do everything you say it's gonna do? Is it perfect? Does it, does it scale? If they actually threw 60 million visitors at it, will it work? Oh my God, of course not, it's a ghost town. Don't open that door, don't open that door. It's just painted on, buildings it looks like buildings not real so you have to kind of you know fake it in every area but if you do it right you end up with that weird effect you know what is it they say you can trade a paper clip for a maserati or something right that <laughs> that thing you, you know what i'm talking about yeah i know exactly what you're talking about. Challenge. it's like a fraternity challenge where take the paper clip go out trade it for an orange find somebody who wants that orange and trade it for like you know i don't know an old glove and then like a thing and then a coat and then a iphone and then pretty soon you've traded a paper clip for a maserati so that Jackie Channing your way up the alley to the top of the building, at some point, you're this guy who like, it looks like I just jumped to the top of a building. Well, you didn't. You kind of jumped from side to side and faked it and you parkoured your way up the side. And now you're standing on top. It doesn't matter. You're on top of the building. You know, you win. 
So it's um, the whole thing. And to answer your question about startups, which is funny, like starting out again, you just have to pick which area you can make the progress in before you can flip that into the next area to make progress over there. And just, you know, keep that in mind as you as you ride it up. It's all about, um, you know, like the second you get funding, you're actually in the hole. Like right. Now you have to prove that you've got a company that's worth that valuation they give you. It's told. I guarantee you it's not. The day that they fund you, it's hopes and dreams, right? Like you're not worth that thing that you got. Now you have to grow into it and then some. Then you have to go back and get more funding. And it's, it's all um, negotiations and it's trading a paperclip for Maserati. Absolutely. That's that's a great analogy. Uh, what are What are your thoughts on... Like customer discovery and doing pre-sales in like in the early stages because I've heard I've heard uh, how you just kind of described it. I've heard different versions of that and another thing I've heard really like really hammered home recently is like that lean startup uh, you know pre-sales customer discovery from day one yeah so uh, my, I mean so many good quotes and all that stuff like um you know, no business plan survives for contact with customers, right? <laughs> right. All, all these, like, so, so the, the, the good thing is go talk to customers as soon as possible. Um, and the thing that I'm doing right now, it's, it's a pivot out of another business. It's like not messy, but it's like, it's never fun when you do that. And you have like the old investors that bet on one for you to do one thing. And now you're doing something completely different. So now you don't know which ones really believe in you. And especially cause I have like an angelist syndicate. Like I literally have like the 70 or 80 investors that are supposed to be your first customers who didn't invest in the thing you're doing now. So they just don't care. Like they just don't get it. They don't care. They, they didn't ask to be along for this, but if I make the money, they're going to be thrilled, right? Ah, let me see. So, um, let me ask the question again. Because I kind of <laughs> went down the path there with my own. You're fine. You're fine. It was, it was, uh, it was, what are your thoughts on like customer discovery and doing pre-sales right. early in the early sta okay. very early stages of a startup? Perfect. So, so what I ended up doing was it looks like I've worked on an app for like 18 months without releasing it. And that's kind of true. Uh, it's really weird, right? I just put an app in the app store like five weeks ago now, but it looks like, you know, to spend an hour, a year and a half working on it, which, which really is horrifying who were, you know, like, like that's anti lean startup, right? Lean startup is like, get it out there, show it, ship it, right? Fail. Um, don't be like Microsoft and take a year to build Microsoft, you know, Word 6 when you had Word 5 in the market, right? They took a year or two in between things. So it was long, you know, cycles of product releases. And so it feels like I did that, but on the bright side, oh my gosh, I've had hundreds of conversations in that year and a half. I've, I've had agencies and brands steer me in a direction and just pull me along with their, their needs, sort of, you know, like needs discovery and things like that, right? And, and telling me what it is they need and telling me when I showed them a product that can kind of, you know, make videos with other people, what do you think of this? They said, oh, this solves our influencer problem where we have takeovers. The takeover model is broken. And I'm like, oh, thanks for telling me what my, what my business is. Like, I just didn't know. I knew I had a product for doing something, but I didn't know until I talked to them. So I've talked to them every step of the way. Same thing with investors, same thing with, you know, like the talent, the creative people who will use the product, right? So I've just been soaking up these conversations and it feels like, I just kind of spend my day talking to people, emailing people, visiting people in different cities, not really building the product enough, certainly not selling, not raising money. What the heck? What's wrong with me? But I can tell you that in the last three months, the case for what it is we're doing, like what what is our reason for being, is so much more laser focused than it was in the three months before that, which was a million times better than, than the six months before that. So you've got to talk to customers. Uh, I, you know, that's part of that, that dopamine hit we talked about before, right? The validation it's when I, you know, I went into, um, I'll, I'll hide all the names and stuff, but I went into a, a media company a couple weeks ago and, uh, showed them, you know, what we're doing. And it's like, Oh, it's like a, you know, video app for making a clip episode, right? Made for making shows with other people. And you and I did a test one, uh, and hopefully it was fun and easy, uh, and all that. Oh yeah. It was totally fun. <laughs> cool. So, so I showed it to them. And then I'm like, I don't really know if they got it. I don't really know if they cared. And it's that same, like, you know, the middle schooler going, oh, nobody liked my Instagram post. I feel like a loser, right? You put yourself out there and then there's crickets, right? And nobody cares. And you feel like I have that feeling all day long. I totally get why those kids delete their stuff and repost their stuff and tweak their stuff. But, you know, the next day I get some texts from them and I'm watching, you know, we, we can see the activity. We can know, we know they're adding videos and trying to make shows together and stuff. And the only texts I get are, hey, this part here is confusing. 
this invitation thing, you know, we did it this way. I get why it happens. We just didn't understand it when we did it. Uh, a little bit confused. Can you answer this question and this question? And how do we do such and such? Because I was clicking this button and I don't know how to delete the thing. I was clicking delete and it was just deleting the clip, not the whole episode. Whatever. So I'm texting them back and I'm like, oh God, you know, they probably, it's like, they probably score me like a D, D minus, D, D plus Oof. if they're feeling generous. Like, this is just not, like, I kind of want these people to use my stuff. I want them to be one of, you know, one of our first paying customers. I really, I kind of need this deal. Like, please, like, they're one of the ones, like, that was warm enough, you know, like, that knows me best. And if I can't win with them, oh, my God, what am I even doing doing this, right? So you're questioning yourself the whole day. And I went in these other meetings, and then we kind of played, like, text tag. And I come out, and I finally get on a call with the person at this company. And I was like, yeah, you know, those things you asked, like, we're already solving one. You know, my, my, I'm only one person working with this guy, Max, who I love in Kansas. And I'm like, Max is already solving the first thing. We're already thinking about adding the second one, but we'll speed it up because it's a problem you're having. Like, like you're kind of hustling, and, like, it's that thing, right? Don't open that door in the ghost town because the whole building's going to fall over, and there's no store behind it. Just It's just painted on. It's a general store. Don't actually expect to get a soda, right? It's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm, like, you know, kind of in this, like, defensive, like, I don't know, trying to accommodate kind of mode. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. Those are my only two complaints. And I get it. You're going to solve them. You've done this stuff in the past. And he starts going off on how he spent the whole day making talk shows with the people he works with. And he didn't interact with them, like, in Slack or in email or on phone calls. He, like, he would, like, beam them, like, ask them a question via my app and get feedback via my app. And they're building little shows. And they'd show them the show that they made afterwards. And I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, no, oh my God, it's like a magic wand of storytelling. Like this, this is literally what he said because I, I typed it while he was saying it. He's like, you need that little like that little sign of positivity, right? It's it it makes you like a talk show host, but smarter. It's kind of like you can go back in time, and you can do all these other things, and you can show up at the next you know the next time you jump into the show, armed with knowledge, having read some thing on Wikipedia or watched a YouTube video, and you come in looking like a genius. So it's not even like a talk show host, like like you and me right now on the podcast. If I mention some crazy band that's like, I don't know, you know, a ska band in Paraguay, and you're like, <laughs> I don't even know. I didn't even know they had ska in Paraguay, right? If you were doing it in my app, you could actually come back the next time we're talking and go, "Wow, I actually watched six of their videos." Like, I have a favorite oh, song yeah. by them now. I'm actually a, a Paraguayan ska band fan now. <laughs> enthusiast, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> right? Right, I'm an enthusiast, right? I mean, and an expert. Like, who else in your town? knows about Scott and Paraguay, right? So so he came back with this glowing review and like totally loves it. You know, fixed a couple of the rough edges. I was like, oh, oh my God, that's more like an A minus B plus review, maybe even an A. Like, you know, as a founder you see all you see you see two big things that are negative. You see uh, you see all the failures. You see all the the emails that somebody doesn't get back to you. Until two weeks later they go, Oh, I just didn't see this and they totally get back to you. And you get a check from them, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that worked out. So you see all the failures. And the other thing, too, is you have this road ahead of you, the next five years. And you know that you have five years of stuff you want to build. You know everything in your product that's missing. When you look at your product, you do not see something small and uh, uh, streamlined and powerful. You see something broken and ugly and embarrassing that's missing all the things that you know need to be in there. And it is very hard as a founder to not look at your product. And I think about this again with Steve Jobs. I think about him announcing the iPhone 1 up on stage. And I think about him getting up there and in the limo on the way to do the announcement, he's already playing with an, I, an iPhone 3 or whatever, right? And he's got to get up there, you know, you know, whatever, all the prototypes and all the stuff, right? And he's got to get up there on stage and look at this ugly thing that he knows is missing, like all the stuff they've dreamed up for the next 10 iPhones and get up there and pretend it's the coolest thing in the world. And it's a very hard thing to do. Take your ugly, broken, 10% completed failure of a product that totally doesn't have any of the things you know that need to be in there and get up there with a, a smile and tell people, this is the coolest thing you're ever gonna see and you need to give me money for this. And I don't mean a little bit of money, I mean twice as much as you thought you'd ever pay for something like this. And have them like applaud and go for it and like you're like and you leave the stage going oh my god i totally fooled them right like, you're, like <laughs> right. you wipe your brow you're like oh they didn't see through the lies they didn't see through the facade the mask that i'm wearing like oh like i, I really fooled them now i've got to go back and build all the other stuff that i'm thinking about it's it's a really it's a really tough thing to 
keep that sort of positive attitude and keep it going. And I, again, I don't know why this is like the therapy podcast, um, <laughs> right. but it, it kind of the kind of is the, the the place we're going. Maybe it's it's where I'm feeling. But it's uh, it's just it's a funny thing. So so again, I don't know what question you answered, but we came back to failure and misery and um, no no we putting on a brave face. I I think that this stuff is really important because. I don't know. I haven't been doing this as long as a lot of other people have, but I've been I've been a part of, you know, some things that didn't go as well as I would have preferred <laughs> or failures as See, other people you, call you them. Learned. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh mm. I I learned at a very long long time ago. Oh shit, 8 years ago maybe. Okay. <laughs> I had a, a um several food carts in different cities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first company didn't really know what I was doing and we failed hard. Like we you know, we were making money. We're like, we have enough to buy another food cart. You know, instead of maybe making this operation we have running better, let's open another one. And so it ended, it ended pretty rough. And, you know, I felt like in that moment I had two, or me and my business partners had two choices. It was either, you know, be mad at each other, blame somebody, blame something else. Uh, you know, it's the weather, it's the economy, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, the president, whoever. And, uh, or you could say like, okay, well, you know, things didn't go exactly how I wanted them to go here. What could I have done differently? What could I have done better? What situations? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. If you can go back in time to that decision to invest more in the one food truck or get the second or third or, you know, the fleet and try to expand, would you do that differently? knowing that it might still not work out, that you might have never taken the chance to go to a second city, a second location, a second truck, a second type of food, right? Versus staying with the first one, maybe having a cute little business that never got big. Because I guarantee you, if McDonald's only had one restaurant ever, you'd never have heard of them. Right. right? They only succeeded because they branched out and franchised. I mean, I, I know the whole complexity to the story. is <laughs> Yeah. Complicated. <laughs> but, but 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 let's do that. You go back in time, and you get to you get to appear, and you're like Trevor of the past. It's me, Trevor from the future. Here's what I think you should do. What do you tell that Trevor? Mm. Well, I would I would go back a step further than even expanding. I would say that when we were negotiating uh, our partnership, I I in my gut I was like, this is a bad idea. I'm seeing red flags pop up, but then I second guessed myself because I said, you know what? I'm not a business person. I don't actually understand really well how the, how these things work. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with these guys because they seem to know more than I do about this. Mm-hmm. Um, would, would you have chosen a different, um, let's say, allocation of shares in terms of you know 50, 50, 25, 25, 25, 25, or w- was it about that, or was it the people you're in business with? It was. I have some I have some advice for you on how you should do that, but yep. or, and that may may help or may not, but. What would you what would you have done differently in that partnership? And you don't have to name names, but oh yeah, I mean, obviously we know we know who these losers are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I I would have just either gone into the business alone or not partnered up with mm-hmm. those guys. Not I don't yeah. mean that they're bad people. It was just that we had different goals out of the business and they didn't line mm-hmm. up together, and because of that, it caused a lot of conflict and maybe some some bad decisions. Plus, my inexperience played. Uh, somewhat of a role in you know i'm like well these guys have done it before so even though i feel like that maybe this isn't the best choice i'm just gonna kind of i'll just go with them because they you know they're the experts not me so that was a tough lesson to learn though it's just like okay maybe when maybe when your intuition or your you're kind of not feeling too good about something maybe best case scenario is like take a step back and ask yourself why why that's the case so back back then, were these people that you would have gone away for the weekend camping with, or gone out on some kind of a, a like a family vacation or a trip with, and would, would do you think that those are the kinds of people that you were getting in business with them? I think at the beginning I would have gone on a trip with them, but based on like the the path that we went on in the business, I think that I would have found the same things that popped up in. In, a, in the business partnership as an issue on the camping trip, right? Like, okay. like one partner was extremely forgetful. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, I forgot to do that. I forgot to do this. Or just not responsible right. maybe is the right word. And then, then the other one would just kind of like disappear for periods of time. Like, oh, right. I know I was supposed to do the books, but I got distracted with other life stuff and I let the books slide for like two months. Huh. 
<laughs> so. it's interesting. And so, so, so one, one thing, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of advice on this too, which is, mm-hmm. you know, if you're partnering up with another person, never 50, 50, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the funny thing is that the, the biggest success I've had to date before this was a 50, 50 partnership. So like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a universal thing. Like, um, you know, thank God that was 50, 50. Um, but in general, you have to have that like deciding vote kind of thing. And not that 51, 49 is really better, but mm-hmm. just having somebody, you know, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do actually to kind of look around the room when you have four or five people who want to start a business together and go, look, if one of us had to start this and hire the rest of the people, knowing that in year two and year three, the person who got us from there to here was not the person who was going to get us in that next phase, right? Who was going to do the sales or do the product or do the whatever it is, right? Or be CEO or be CFO, be whatever they're going to be. It, it's an interesting thing to see if those five people can agree on who should really be the owner and who should be vesting into their shares and that there should be outs, you know, or, or even a 50-50 partnership, ways to buy each other out. And there are different techniques like um, there's one thing where you can set it up so that you can uh, pull a trigger and you get to uh, make an offer to buy the business, but the other, but the person, one person sets the value and the other person decides who goes and who stays. And this is a really clever thing, which is if I decide that I think our business, that you and I just did this food truck, we think it's a million dollar food truck. So I will offer you a half a million dollars to buy you out. Now that means I have to have a half a million dollars or have some financing lined up that believes it's a million dollar business that would give me a half a million dollars to back me up on that. But at the same time, I have to hand that decision to you and you get the choice of whether to take the money or whether to stay and uh, pay the money, right? So it, it, there's really weird triggers and there's all these little like game theory type things that you can do. But it's kind of a funny thing because if you set the price too high and they call you on it, you don't have the money and the business isn't worth it. If you set the price too low, they're just gonna pay you and you're gone. And you were kind of hoping to stay, right? So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing to try to figure out who really counts as the owner in a business? Mm-hmm. Who really is the founder? Who should be able to hire and fire the other people when you have five co-founders? It's really, really messy. Yeah, I really like that, that those two triggers you just said, though, because it almost guarantees that it has to be a fair deal, right? Right. It's like the Solomon, like, cutting the baby in half kind of story. It's <laughs> like one of those things, right? Like, it's kind of painful and weird, but if you, you know, you're kind of both in on it and you can't really screw the other person over, you kind of have to do what's right for the business, I, I think. So. Yeah. I, yeah. That, oh, that's a, that'd be an interesting situation to, to watch play out. You know, right. I right. don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to be involved with it, but that would be interesting. You no, know, they're see. usually messy, like all the Uber stuff where they're, you know, like all these things of like who gets to stay and who wants power versus money versus shares versus, you know, whatever controls who wants who wants to stay, who's going to stay to the end, even if it's not right for the business, who's going to leave. You know, it's it's um it's at, at the at the extreme end, you know, when there's great success, it can often be worse than if there's great failure, because really. When it's a failure of a business, we're fighting over what percentage I have of zero versus what percentage you have of zero, or hell, negative a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So you know, I'm cool with a less percentage of that, right? It's uh, it's something that you know, it's, it's like you know, you want to see somebody what somebody's really like, give them give them power, mm-hmm. right? Um, so it's that kind of thing. Take it to the extreme on the success end, and you'll see the bigger drama. So it's funny. Right. Yeah, and it's, I think the original thing that we were talking about was like actually learning from your experiences of running a startup. I know we've been going on all kinds of tangents, but they've been, they've been good. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation so far. Me too. It's always therapy. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about what Clipisode is and how it works. Um, Cause I, I want to talk about Clipisode before we play some of the, some of the questions that we had come in um, just to give it some context on what people are hearing. Yeah, totally. That's, that's cool. So, um, so, so I, what my favorite thing to do is go on a podcast and say like, Clipisode is the podcast killer. It's the anti-podcast podcast. <laughs> oh no. Uh, which, which is funny. Yeah, no, I know. No, no, no podcasts have their place. It's, it's funny. And there's some great podcasters. So my best friends, it's very funny. Like, so my best friends are podcasters, right? Uh, before you tell a podcaster joke. Um, anyway, the, uh, so in, in a nutshell, it's, it's a way to make, uh, stories, you know, video stories with other people. And you think, okay, right? People make Snapchat stories, people make Instagram stories. People do these little eight second, 15 second snapshots of their day just while they're walking down the street, pull out the phone, say something really cute, put some text over it, yay. Um, and then you're really like, okay, we're gonna do this with other people. And we think it's going to be a great way for musicians and authors 
and creative people to engage their fans, you know, basically take their fans and put them on stage with them, put them on a talk show with them and ask their fans, you know, if you're JK Rowling, Hey, what's your favorite, you know, what, what one death in the Harry Potter series would you like me to roll back if I could go back and take that out, you know, and you're oh, going to wow. get some people replying. Right. And so she can now make these five, six, 10 minute video shows with her fans where they're just submitting questions or submitting answers to her questions or submitting content. And she's including it in her show. So she can now make, 30 minutes, you know, three 10 minute video shows a week. And it doesn't even take her 30 minutes, right? In what universe does anybody make 30 good looking minutes of video content where it doesn't take them six hours, right? That's your, your sort of podcasting, right? There's a prep time, all the stuff that goes in, then you do the show, then you do the production afterwards, like you can spend a whole day making a one hour podcast. And then you kind of worry about like, how much of that gets seen? Well, a 10 minute video, they're probably gonna watch it all the way through if they're Harry Potter fans. An hour-long podcast, they're going to watch it if they care about the guest or the content or the host, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a different thing. There's a there's a very famous um, online interview show for a big media brand, and it's 30 minutes long, and their average viewing time is four and a half minutes. And they sell ads against it, and they consider it to be a, a big success. And I just think if you have a 30-minute video show and people are watching four and a half minutes, that's a failure. And why don't you just make a four and a half minute video show? So, Clipisode is a way to make videos with other people that's really easy. And like three dozen companies have tried this before, including Facebook, and they all went about it the wrong way, and they all failed. All of them, including Facebook, failed at this, shut down their little app that they did. It was called Riff. Mm. Uh, but there's a bunch of other ways for making like videos with friends, right? It's, I'm not the first person to think about this, but we're the first ones to do it in a radically different way. And the biggest, the two big radically different ways are um, only the host needs the app, so instead of telling everybody, you know, go download the Riff app and we can all make Ice Bucket Challenge videos together, which was when Riff came out, it was around the time that Ice Bucket Challenge, um, nobody's going to download your app. Like your friends aren't going to download your app. If you are Bono and all the U2 fans around the world want to submit a video question to you and be on your show, the second Bono says go download either the U2 app or the Riff app or Jump Cam or Weave or what, all these stupid named apps, you're like, sorry, Bono, I would have your baby but I will not download an app for you. Like I literally, I literally would give birth to your child and just, you know, just go off and live my own life and play U2 songs for them all day long. Yeah. But I, I'm not downloading an app to ask you one video question. Not going to happen. So ours acts, um, ours works by using just a link. So we just, you, you start a show, you start an episode, you ask that question, um, which Harry Potter death would you like me to take back in the next book? If I do another book and I'll pretend, you know, let's retcon it, pretend it didn't happen. And, then you go and you put that little video out and you put that link, that little video on Twitter, on Facebook, you text it to people, you email it to people, you get the content back. They just click a link and they reply from their phones. So that's kind of the magical part is for guests. Mm -hmm. There just is no app. You just click a link anywhere. Then yeah. The second part is it's not live. So think about this podcast, right? You may ask me a question <laughs> and I go off on a tangent and I go, oh crap, what was the question again, right? This happened I think twice now. <laughs> um, in, 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 the, in, in a clip episode, when you ask this thing, I can go and do a retake. It's just using the camera on my phone. So, so one, before I go to respond, because it's not live, right? On this, like tomorrow, I'm gonna wake up and go, oh my God, there's this thing I answered. Like I should have just said this. Oh, I, I just thought of a much better answer for your question, right? That's how it works on live TV, on podcasts, on live, Facebook Live, right? Um, on a clip episode, you can ask me a question and I can go Google the answer if, if, um, you know, if the, if the cast of Homeland says, you know, what was your favorite moment from season two? I think they're on like season six or seven or eight now. But they, they say, what was the fa favorite moment on season two? Well, if I tell them my favorite moment, but it was actually in season three, fans are going to call me out on that. I'm going to look like an idiot. I just got up and asked the Homeland people uh, uh, something or I told them something about, that I love about their show. And then all the other Homeland fans, all the other super fans are calling me a moron because I told them a season three thing. Ah, oh, what, a, what a dork. Well... Before I answer, I can hit Google. I can go to IMDb. I can go watch videos. I can like I like I can look at I can ask my friend, hey, what was your favorite moment from season two? I can get a great answer. And if you're armed with good content when you come back in, you're gonna make a great, tight, excellent, smart, accurate four and a half minute show instead of a thirty minute one where you ramble and don't know the answers and stuff like that. So really the two biggest things that we do to make these things are only the host needs the app, everybody else magically responds from their phones with no app and the second piece is not live so i can google get a good answer come back with great content do a second or third take and then submit my answer and you end up with these just really tight short 
shows where everybody looks like a genius. I know I definitely had to take a couple retakes on a, a few of them I've tried. Uh -huh. So you brought this up a couple times. So I have to know which Harry Potter character would you uh, prefer J.K. Rowling rolled back the death I, of? I love this question. So I've never read a Harry Potter book and I've never watched any of the movies and I can't even tell you who died, which is great because now you don't have to put spoiler alert on your, uh, on your podcast because I'm not going to mention the, I, I like Game of Thrones, Harry Potter. I actually don't like Lord of the Rings fantasy. I'm just not into it. If, if JK Rowling listens to this though, and wants to try my app, like I will go read every one of her friggin' books. I will devour <laughs> those things. And I will learn them inside and out. And I, I would love to have her using, um, clip episode. But I, I don't know. I, I wish I knew. I have, I have a lot of friends who are like, you know, waited for each book to come out and each movie. And, you know, how cool is that? But that's very funny. I have no idea. <laughs> that's awesome. That was if, if you'd asked me before what I thought you were going to say, I would I would not have guessed that you hadn't actually read the books or yep. watched the movies. <laughs> nope, not at all. Not at all. All right, you ready? You ready for some of these questions from uh, from the little clip episode show that we put together? Ooh, actually, the clip episode. Yeah, totally. So the one thing people are going to miss out on on an audio podcast. Yep. Is um is that these are all brandable? Like that's kind of the third piece to it, right? So it's it's no app to download except for the host. It's not live. But then the the thing that we found when I talked about you know brands and agencies telling us what our business should be was like if we can put our branding on this and make it say McDonald's or the Minions movie or whatever, like this is going to be amazing. Like make a talk show in your hand. That's got all the artwork and all the stuff done. That's really cool. So, uh, so I know that you've used this, you have put it out there. You didn't actually publish the episode and you don't need to make it brandable because you're just using the audio, which is just a nifty way that, you know, we kind of didn't intend on the product being used, but man, more power to you for getting questions for your show via my video app, you know, for your audio show. Yeah. So what I'm actually going to do is once, See, I didn't know if I'd be able to successfully use the clip after I published it on the episode. Uh -huh. So what I'm going to do is once uh, once the episode is edited and ready to, to be published, I will put out the clip, produce the clip episode episode, and then I'll tag yeah. all the people that have asked questions as when I put it out there. Probably run ads on Great. the on the video itself too. So so you'll get some free clip episode ad dollars <laughs> thrown your way. I love it. No, well, so so when I talk to people about about clip episode versus podcasts, right? I do say it's kind of the cure for a lot of the problems in podcasts or a lot of the problems in Facebook Live and Periscope, right? There are a lot of things that are that are not good about Facebook Live and, and Periscope and live video that you know, like the, the best thing that anybody ever invented for internet video is a fast forward button and you can't use it when you're watching Facebook yeah. Live. And every Facebook Live is an hour long. Anyway, uh, but I do think it goes hand in hand. The types of people who can do a podcast who know lots of interesting people are the kind of people who can do two clip episodes a week ask 10 friends, 10 smart friends, a question about something in their industry, get back three, four or five answers. You don't need all 10, mm -hmm. make a show, never the same guest twice. So I think it goes hand in hand and becomes kind of like a teaser trailer. Like that thing that you're talking about generating, it'll point to this episode. Here's the full hour long conversation, but here's a three minute warm up. These are the kinds of questions that are going to be answered. How cool is that? So go ahead. yeah, let's do it. Hey guys, this is Andrew Vick coming from the How Factory office. Uh, Brian, my question for you is, aside from being on Trevor's podcast, uh, what's been the biggest failure that you faced? And how did you overcome or, or react to that? And how has that shaped, um, I guess, your career moving forward? Thanks. Uh, so it's a funny question. I mean, it's one we already touched on, right? Uh, yep. Man, but how mean. I, uh, I have friends like this. Uh, they're my so, favorite. <laughs> aren't they great? So, so you know, I would say actually um, – you know, I, I, when I talk about my career, I do say I have like these multi-million dollar successes, but I've also had like more, you know, failures and, and even multi-million dollar ones, right? Like it's it's a lot of ups and downs. So there's tons of failures and I can point it to failures all day long, all week long. You know, I, I, there hasn't been one. Um, I just think I, I've been lucky enough not to have one that was so catastrophic that I was, you know, banned from the industry or never allowed to play again, right? Caught doping or whatever, like, and now I'm out. Right. Um, so, uh, so no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I, you know, you know, if somebody's not going to be nice to you, I'm not going to answer their question seriously. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the next question? <laughs> All right. Hey, guys, this is Michael Carraway from Denver, Colorado. Uh, and recently I just read that podcasts are growing around 76% year over year. Uh, my question is, how do you see that impacting the current state of marketing? Um, and do you think that's going to impact social media specifically? Hmm. So my first answer is 88% um, of all statistics are made up, and uh, so I wouldn't put any, you know, I, I don't know, that, that's made up too, right? So, <laughs> right. Um, 
so I, you know, I don't know about the numbers of year over year growth, and it depends on who you're looking at, right? Is is the view is the listening time, viewing time, growing? Is revenue growing? You know, I think that uh, you know it definitely had a you know resurgence with serial, right? You know, I mean, I know people who were podcasting in definitely in 2004 because the 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 content management platform that I built that Engadget ran on, it didn't it had RSS feeds, but it didn't have. Um, and so it was probably 2003, going on 2004. It didn't have uh, the the media, like the embedding, like the, the way to embed a podcast along as a as a, a payload with the RSS feed, so that people could get the thing. So the the Engadget guys had to hand edit the RSS feeds and hated me because my stupid platform back in 2004 didn't support adding podcasts to blog posts and that sort of thing and having those like the, the media uh, tag on them. So it's been around for a long time. You know, every three or four years, it's the year of the podcast. Like they're totally here, they've totally made it. It's now a, it's now a thing, and I think it's like any other business, right? Uh, it's hit driven. You know, if you're big and successful, like there are people who I would tell, like, don't stop podcasting. You're one of the best in the world at it. You actually make money at it, and that's that's a rare thing, you know. Um, and then there's everybody else, right? Podcasting, but it's the same thing in music. You know, you got your top one percent. You know, making all the hits, making all the money, getting record deals, and you got. 99% of the rest of the world, they're playing their asses off at clubs and house parties, house concerts, you know, doing you know, birthday parties, like doing anything they can do, busking on, you know, the, the boardwalk in Santa Monica, you know, the, or the, uh, the promenade. You know, it's really, really hard. So, you know, is podcasting growing? Is it amazing? I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, is it growing for everybody? No. And do I think it's going to change anything? I think audio itself is a strange space, I say, on your audio podcast. Um, <laughs> All right. In that... You know, like, what does it mean? Like, I, like, like after we had the idea for a clip episode and we started building it and we we're nowhere near getting it ready, you know, a year and a half ago, Anchor was announced. And Anchor was like, it was like the audio version of clip episode. And it was like, oh, those bastards can't believe this. What the heck? Like, this is exactly our idea, but for audio. And then it turns out, well, no, everybody needs the app to join the shows. And you can't really curate it and kick somebody out. It's kind of like tweet responses. You can't really choose who's going to talk next after you and then they've pivoted into this thing where like they have different channels where i'm the politics show and you're the tech show and somebody else is the car show and you know that's just how it's going to be um so i don't know i think people try out this stuff i think audio is interesting what does audio mean for social media uh, i think twitter and facebook and instagram instagram and snapchat in particular are very visual what does audio mean there at the same time i have a friend i'm an advisor in a company called uh, spoken layer which oh yeah voice I've heard actors of that. and robots right that change that uh that transcribe or you know reverse transcribe right that that convert you know TechCrunch blog posts or you know ap stories or i don't even know who they work with like i can't even tell you the companies um but take their content and let's say it's huffington post they'll take every huffington post story or time time magazine they'll take all these stories and they'll convert them into audio so you always have a play now and listen to this button or save it to listen to it later or they'll bundle up stuff and do like a 30 minute show that's all the tech sites and Wired and TechCrunch and whatever and talking about all the stuff or all the politics stuff. And it's a really, really cool thing, but um, it's, it's, it's weird. Audio, I mean, I can talk about audio for a long time. Audio is, is really fascinating because you can spend your day working in Photoshop or coding and you can listen to music yeah. clearly, easily. But can you listen to somebody, eh, if it's NPR and they're talking about stuff, sure. If it's an interview, I don't know. If it's educational content, that's really hard. Like an audio book, I can't listen to an audio book while I code. I can't, you know, you just can't, you, you got to focus on one or the other. I can listen to Spotify all day long while I code, right? So where does audio fit? Well, it fits on commutes. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to have more commuting in the future or less with the rise of Uber and self-driving cars and all these other things and hyperloops and, you know, the boring machine tunnels and stuff, right? I don't know. I think there's more but it's a certain type of people in a certain type of city. So a certain type of content makes sense for them. It's not, you know, in Ohio or Missouri that they're, you know, or maybe they are commuting for hours to go to the place where they work because they're rural. Like maybe I've got it completely wrong. But anyway, they're, um, some of the most interesting stuff I've heard about this is it's growing, but the whole internet's growing and everything's growing. Media is growing. That, um, that you think about it and audio is amazing for blind people. And that's a really weird thing people will say about these businesses when they want to marginalize them and say that they're not worth anything. But the counter argument to that is 
every one of us at some point during the day, every day, is blind. So when we're driving, we cannot be reading TechCrunch blog posts. We can totally be listening to them. You know, there are cases where you can't look at your phone, where it makes sense for it to be talking to you. Audio interfaces are on the rise, right? Who am I to say this? This shouldn't be the next big thing. But it's not my thing. Um, I love visual stuff and videos, but uh, but podcasts are fascinating. So that was fun talking about that. I don't really have an opinion. <laughs> I said a lot. Yeah, no, it all made sense because as you were like about to say something, well, you could use it then or this. I'm like, oh, I was thinking along the same lines because I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's like I'm whenever I'm doing something and I want to listen to something other than music, like I'm usually not watching it, even if it is a video, yeah. unless it's like a instructional video. I usually just listen to it. So it's sure, right. It's inter- It's all interesting, really, because it's I don't know. I feel like there's going to be a place for it. But then again. I also feel like if you're going to get into pod, really, if you're going to get into anything, you should you should want to do it whether or not it's going to be, you know it's going to be successful, right? It's something that you kind of want right. to do anyways, or there's going to be some other benefit out of it. Yeah, so correct, right? So I think a lot of podcasts work like that, right? This is not their primary job. Mm-hmm. Blogging was like that back in the day. You know, you had a job and you would just blog while you're at your job whatever your job is like you you know you're a toll booth collector like <laughs> right you just, blogging on the side. you just you layer that money in but it's never it's not going to pay your mortgage unless you live in you know a, a really small town somewhere it's not going to do that i don't know i it's funny i'll tell you that you know I, I don't know if i really want to admit this but that i do listen to podcasts i'd say like every other day we have this is like a really weird story oh, we have a big backyard and we have four dogs and you know they do their thing on the outside you know their yard mm-hmm. all, all the time and every other day I'm out there collecting all the stuff they left me and I just like I don't really want to listen to music then and I found there's a, there's a pot a specific podcast this the sales podcast it's like the advanced selling podcast these guys Brian and Bill and like I'm I kind of need somebody to be talking about sales in my ear all the time and I don't even listen to all the episodes I listen to a couple of choice ones like almost on loop because these little 10 15 minute podcasts so I don't commute I, it's, it's, you know, every couple of weeks I'm in San Francisco, so it's like an hour long commute, even then I want to listen to music. But when I'm cleaning my dog's yard work up, I listen to podcasts, but sales podcasts only. So that's a really weird, you know, use case. I'm not blind at that point. I'm just really, really don't want to be thinking about what I'm doing. I don't want to be thinking about imagining collecting checks from customers. So there you go. I think that that, um, I think that you have a lot, well, something in common with a lot of people when they're trying to do something that they would prefer to be mindless, that they would uh, be listening right. to to something educational or something to take their mind off of it. Totally. All right, let's, let's key up this next one here. Let's say you have a content creation platform like Reddit or Product Hunt. When should you start to really look at monetizing your users? Wow, so that's a very, very interesting thing. Um, because I think about this a lot, right? Like I'm, I'm purposefully not doing like pre-rolls and stuff on top of videos that people are doing. I'm kind of promising we're not going to do that because I just don't think like 30 second ads in front of a three minute video makes a lot of sense, right? Like, you know, Vine failed to monetize Vine with six second uh, videos, of course. You know, so this is that Jackie Chan answer again, right? Like as soon as you can, as soon as you can convince somebody that you have an audience that's worth selling to them. And... You know, and I don't mean round up the numbers and lie. I don't mean, you know, claim that they all, you know, every single one of our listeners makes over a hundred grand a year, right? Like, don't do that. Don't flat out lie to them. But, you know, you've got to go and work it from both sides. So go find your audience, do demographic surveys of them, right? If you have people visiting your site or people listening to your podcast, leaving a review of your podcast, make sure they leave a lot of reviews because if you get twice as many reviews as another podcast, you'll get more advertising. Same thing on the website. So make sure you get those testimonials. Make sure that you have some people who will rave about you and say that they can't live without your site. And then the better thing is make sure that they're willing to say that, you know, the last time I bought a, you know, whatever, uh, you know, fitness equipment, it was because I saw a recommendation on this site and I loved it. And then come back and leave a little testimonial and say, yeah, that, that, you know, exercising ball that you, you know, the last one I bought popped, this one you guys recommended didn't. That's so cool. Thanks, guys. Um, you know, I, I really, you know, this is why I visit you guys. This is why I signed up for your newsletter. This is why I have you in my you know, RSS reader, whatever, whatever the heck your thing is, or follow your Twitter, or get your alerts on my phone. 
um, make sure you get those testimonials. Then take a bunch of those, right? Roll them up, put them in your hands, run across the street to people with the money and say, look, look, I have raving fans, but not only, you know, because listeners, it doesn't matter, right? I've looked at businesses, actually almost acquired a business where they had these like influencers sending out these gift boxes or whatever. And the funny thing was people with, you know, two, three, four million followers might only get 10 people signing up for their gift box. But then you get somebody else with like 20,000 followers who would get a thousand people signing up for their gift box. So you need to be that kind of business that doesn't just have the bulk numbers, but moves the needle. That when you mention a product, when that advertiser advertises they're going to get ROI, they're going to get some kind of uh, you know uh, traction, some kind of great results, and you need to be that thing. And if you're building something that isn't going to be that, then you're not going to make it as an advertising-driven um, business. I couldn't agree more. And something you said that really reminded me of, I was listening to or watching one of, <laughs> I was listening to one of Noah Kagan's videos because I don't actually uh, watch them, <laughs> but. Funny. He was talking about email lists and I've been like, I've been all about like, how can I grow my email list as fast as possible? And, and I, you know, I'm reading everything I can, doing as much as I can, testing out things. And then I'm listening to this video and he says something like, all right, you want, you want like the secret to like a, like a, how to improve your email list. He's like, go purge every, e everybody off your list that hasn't opened an email from you in the last two months. Ah, right. And I'm like, that's really, that's damn. Really good. He's like, Cause those people don't care about you. He's like, you only want to reach the people that care. And he's like, you're going to have, you're going to see like your open rates are going to go up. Um, the Gmail algorithm is going to right. like favor your emails more because so many people are actually opening and interacting yeah, with them. It's not right. So, yeah. So I'll tell you that the, the two, two of the, the, um, I don't know. I'd like to say they're the smartest people in media, but two of the people, I, let's say, I mean, they probably are. Uh, I, they're probably both smarter <laughs> than me. But um, but two of the people I respect the most were in really interesting positions like that, where they had something that wasn't the most popular, that wasn't the most mainstream, that wasn't a mass market audience, but they had enormous influence. And uh, one was uh, Rafat Ali, uh, Rafat, Rafat Ali. He uh, started paid content a long time ago and sold that to The Guardian. And then he started this thing called Skift, uh, which is a travel news uh, brand. And then within like a one year, it was like now beating you know Yahoo Travel and like whatever the other travel sites were that are out there. Like it just came out of nowhere, just owned the space. Now he has the biggest conference in the space. I think it's amazing. But back when he did paid content a long time ago, they didn't have like CPM based stuff. They had a newsletter, they had uh, they had conferences, things like that too. But they they wouldn't have survived if they said we need to be paid based on the traffic and how many impressions we're going to get your ad, your ads, uh, you know, how many views we're going to get seen for you, stuff like that, or even the clicks. But it was that they just had all the right people there on their site. And he's done it again with Skift where like everybody in the industry who matters is there. They're reading it. It's the first thing that breaks all the news. It's like the biggest thing. And then the second one I'll tell you about, and this is, you know, for your, um, your media uh, question here from this, you know, I've, I've built it the next Reddit, right? Which is, which is awesome. Love, more power to you. Good. Jason Hirshhorn, so he had, uh, he had an interesting career. He, he, he did, I think it was Slingbox. Like, he worked at MTV. Like, he, he was acquired into MTV. He just knows everybody in media. I think he's on the board of MGM. Like, he's on a lot of stuff. I'm, and I'm, again, like, tomorrow I'll look this all up on the internet. And I go, damn it, I wish I had said these other things. But anyway, he's, he's super influential. For a while, he was the co-CEO of MySpace with uh, Mike Jones. And so the two of them ran that for a bit. And uh, he was like a New York guy in L.A., totally didn't belong. Uh, and then he, then he left. But he always, alongside of all those other businesses he did, ran a daily newsletter, and it was called Media Redefined or Media Redef. And this newsletter would be like 15 to 40 links of just stuff that he read about the day before. So he was one of those people who would sit in a feed reader, find all the stuff, read hundreds of stories so he can give you the 12 best ones or the 20 best ones. And it's actually... It's, it's so good it's annoying because if you subscribe to his newsletter, like it's going to waste an hour every day because you're going to open this link. Oh, got to read this one too. Oh, my God, how did I miss that? Boom. Open. If you open like 20, 30 new tabs and you and some of these are like you know the oral history of the making of the Caddyshack movie or whatever. It's like it just goes on and on and on. You're like, damn. It's like being assigned a lot there, three hours of homework. Like I have a startup to run. I can't open your newsletters. But the cool thing was back when I first met him, 
I think he had only like 5,000 subscribers, but those 5,000 subscribers were the three, you know, uh, you know, Larry and Sergey and Eric <laughs> right. and Google, right? And Rupert Murdoch. Okay, now Rupert Murdoch doesn't read email, but his, like what I knew at the time, because I was actually working on a thing in his, in his offices in his building, was like his assistant would print out that newsletter. Like the media redefined newsletter would get like printed out and handed to Rupert Murdoch on paper. And he would like look through it and read the stuff and go, oh, tell me more about that one, right? So he wasn't like a, you know, like me opening your thing in Gmail and opening 30 new browser tabs and sitting on your laptop all day long. Right. Like He's a billionaire, billionaire, lots of things to do, media companies to run. But, you know, when you can say, I only have 5,000 subscribers, somebody else has 50 or 500,000 subscribers. Yeah, but I've got all the good subscribers, right? That Noah Kagan thing you said, that makes me smile because that's that's the thing. If you can say... No, no, no. I don't throw big parties, but when I do, it's like only billionaires, you know, and yeah. you know, celebrities and athletes and all this stuff, right? You're like, okay, well then, I guess that's a that's a better party, right? So yes, you can totally hone in. But I love that 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 hack, that trick. And Noah Kagan's a genius. Um, so I mean, obviously, everything he's going to say is going to be really smart, like, and <laughs> right? Off off the charts, really cool. But that one about like pr prune your list, stop sending mail that doesn't get opened. Google sees that. Why would they treat you favorably? Send mail that gets open. If you can, if you can go to an advertiser and say, "I have a 69% open rate instead of a 6% open rate," you're a genius. Then they go, "Well, how many subscribers do you have?" You go, well, "I only have 5,000, but they're the best 5,000." They open all my stuff and they buy things when I mention them. Now, don't pay me based on CPM. Pay me based on the fact that I own, you know, I have Larry, Sergey, Larry and Sergey, and you know, Rupert Murdoch on my, on my thing. Right? Pretty amazing. Great advice. Yeah, it's uh, another friend of mine launched a, a, a course recently, and we were talking, and I was like, "How many, uh, how many emails you got on your list?" Because he was like, "Oh yeah, I just." He's like, "You know, I haven't done any marketing, even though my course is on how to do online marketing." <laughs> he's like, "I haven't." He's like, "I haven't ran any ads." I'm like, "Really?" And he's like, "Yeah." I have a, he's like, "I have an email list of 300 people, and wow. almost all of them bought." Wow. Yeah. Like, so there, there you go. That's incredible. <laughs> that's, that's the right way to do it. That's yeah. the thing to do. Why, yeah. why on earth would you send stuff to people who don't read it, right? Who don't open it, who don't care, who aren't going to buy it. So that yeah. back to that same thing, that business that I looked at acquiring uh, uh, like one company ago where they had people who were like with 2 million followers who couldn't get, you know, a couple dozen people to subscribe to their sort of, you know, box of goodies, but people with 20,000 who were an author who had a super engaged audience could get a thousand to sign up. Like, that's amazing to put in a credit card and do that thing. So, so there's a huge difference between having a large fan base, especially if you pay for Instagram followers and Twitter followers and things like that, right? That's just a waste of time. Then your then your open rates and all your success, your click rates are are nothing. They're terrible. Uh, versus having a tight, small audience that really cares about what you want and you can mobilize them and get them to do things for you and get them to spread the word for you, get them to buy your advertiser products and then rave about how good they were so you can get more advertisers. That's that's so good. Yeah, I um, I'm gonna definitely take some time to do that after, especially after hearing him say it and then talking about it. I'm right. I'm putting that towards the top of my next time I have like an hour or two of <laughs> of uh, of time to dive in. I'm gonna work on that. Well, and it's counterintuitive, right? Delete half your list so that your list will grow faster. Yeah, it's you like, know? but it it works with rose bushes, right? Yeah, it's it's like being willing to to do the things. Uh, that other people aren't aren't willing to do like you know a lot of people are all about those vanity metrics um yep. but it's 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 almost like you want to pick your audience sure. right sure. it's i completely agree i i had that conversation with a friend of mine who does music events he does a great job and you know he wants to he wants to make bigger and better music events and he pitched me on this one he was like i want to get your thoughts on it and it was like you know uh, some type of generic festival. No, no offense to him. And I'm like, okay, well, you have all these other festivals, right? They all have like a theme to them. Like, can you just pick a theme here? And he's like, well, I don't want to like rule anyone out. I'm like, well, you know, like, do you want these types of people there? No, not really. Do you want these types of people there? No, not really. Do you want, well, who do you want there? Well, these are the people I want. I'm like, okay, well, why don't you make a festival for them? And just leave everyone else out. Tell them like, <laughs> if they want to come, they'll come anyways. But if they don't, then don't don't cater to them. Right. So yeah. this happens in music all the time, where you see somebody get political, mm -hmm. and then everybody's second guessing that and saying, "Oh man, why why did you go there? Why did you do that? Because you know you just alienated half your half your audience." And that may or may not be true. You alienated half of America, 
but you might not have alienated half of your audience and you might actually be psyching up the audience that was right for you to go out there and fight for you and talk about you more and maybe attracting more people from that. So by instead of saying like, let's say America has 300, 300 million people, like instead of saying, well, I just eliminated 150 million people at ever buying my next album or following me on Twitter or whatever the thing is. Yeah, but that other 150 million people, there's a lot of customers in there. There's a lot of fans left in there. You don't have you don't have 150 million fans. Like, you have a million. Like, I think you may have just done a good thing, right? So you always have to wonder, like, was that a genius idea? But uh, but standing for something is a hell of a lot better than standing for nothing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So we have one one clip episode question left, and then I have a couple we, couple questions that I usually ask all of our guests to kind of wind up or wind up uh, <laughs> wind down the uh, the interview. Right. Uh, cool. This one's from my friend Sarah. She works for uh, she works for a regional newspaper, so I think it'll probably be like a media question or something. So let's see what she I has to it. say. Hey Brian, thanks for taking our questions. I am wondering what one piece of advice you would give to traditional publishers uh, when they're thinking about video in particular and these new technologies like Clipisode that give us so many more opportunities to engage with people online. Thanks. Wow. So that is a great, there's a couple questions in there, right? Mm -hmm. what, what advice would I give to them in general? Um, double down on their strengths, right? If you are a regional newspaper, your strength is local, right? Yahoo News and USA Today cannot cover your local like you can cover your local, right? That's always been your strength. They cannot also, they, they also don't know how to sell into the local businesses, right? How to feature them. They, they just don't have that, right? So definitely don't, you know, definitely like lean into that thing. Be be the champion of all your local teams. Be the champion of all your local causes. Um, so that's just generic advice for people in, in, in those kinds of businesses. In terms of video, I mean, I, I'm, it's you know it's of course self-serving like i think you should you know use my product we should talk about that right like, I'd love to get our content together. no because you know because really having like honest conversations and featuring these people so let's say your business is super local it's one town and you've got like the car dealer pays and the, 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 the local donut shop that isn't a chain is paying and these different, different people are paying and you know to sponsor things and to sponsor the school teams and you're really tied up in that little circle um i would say making content with them putting them up on stage putting them into your videos having them you know, talk about how amazing the fair was or the rally or the, you know, the elections or what they think. I mean, um, but it just doesn't even have to be like local in terms of small local market. We're talking to um, a very giant uh, media company outside of the U.S. about like all their politics and sports coverage. And they are, you know, like a like every old media company is, they're looked at as like something that was super important and critical in the 1950s less important in the 80s and completely irrelevant today right and their mandate is how do we get millennials involved in what we do how do we get young people talking about these things they're already talking about the soccer games and the politics and all these other things going on in the tv shows and you know what, whatever these things are in this, this, this region um how do we get them talking about it with us instead of talking about it with themselves hmm. on, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these different places. I haven't, um, I haven't. So that's, that's really the challenge, you know? And so that's, that's, that's what I talked to them about is how to be a company that does great, great stories and does, you know, like, like one of our first customers is a, a delivery company um, that has 400,000 employees. And again, was like, you'd think they're from the 1950s and they haven't changed since the fifties and they're trying to change that mindset. And I think, showing that you're good at stories and walking around pulling out a phone doing an eight second clip asking somebody something being very casual but still having the ability to make it very curated and very controlled but look like off the cuff ugc content friends just talking about stuff but take out the weirdos right <laughs> right that's an interesting an interesting balance right how do you make it look like you're young and hip but still also keep out the crazies and then feature your audience on stage and your content to make them go out and be ambassadors for your brand and love you to death I will. I'll definitely make that connection for you. She's pretty awesome. Um, one of the one of the things that that I thought of was like if they're for like local at least based on something you said. I kind of want to riff on it a little, but it's like almost like you said they can't like these big media companies can't do local. So I I think of like the things I think of the things I like to read when it comes to sports or media. And uh, was it Grantland or something like that? I think it was Bill Simmons. Whenever he'd write an article. I would, it would just be very, it'd be like a very well-written story or something like that. And like, sure. you know, 
it's almost and everything is so like quick fire today on social media and like you everybody's always like trying to run to be the first out there but i don't see a lot of local well at least local here doing like a lot of very super in-depth storytelling around absolutely around those things so, so right so that's the thing so so it doesn't just have to be that you know the space but absolutely do the kind of media they're not doing right so if everybody else is doing you know regurgitated stuff ap stories formatted by ai you know that spit out sports scores or whatever go behind the scenes talk about the coach and the star player or the one that didn't make it or tell all those stories right mm -hmm. do the long form journalism type stuff there's you know you, you know for a fact there's no way on earth that a you know a national newspaper is going to cover your stuff like that and tell it in such a way and yeah of course i mean it's it's a it's a um it's, it's a trick but you know that you know, if you get six quotes from people instead of two oh my god six more people are going to buy that paper and like frame it and tell their friends about it right because they were mentioned in it right that's the whole point of doing video shows where you never have the same six people on it twice right every single show you get new people you're actually tapping into each of those little mini groups to go out and promote you that's why you do a podcast that doesn't have the same guest every time if you had me on twice or three times in a row god forbid um nobody cares the third time i'm on i'll tell you a very funny story there was a um an old comic book uh, artist and he had never gone to any of the conventions never done a comic-con never done the new york one never done san diego never done all these things and he'd been kind of out of the industry for you know 20 30 years whatever it was and they convinced him to come to one of these things and like come there because people have old things they want signed they've never met you and he showed up and there were just lines like out the door wrapping around people were talking to him posing taking pictures of him all this stuff it was amazing he's like oh my god what was i why did i skip this for all these years he came back the next year and he had really short lines and he's like do people not love me anymore they're like no they just there's all this pent-up demand they really 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 wanted to meet you they got you to autograph all their stuff they don't have another copy of ghost rider or whatever the thing is for you to like autograph so they just don't need to meet you again right so same thing diminishing returns if you had me on as a guest on your show tomorrow the next day not gonna work but flip it around get a new guest each time and i'm gonna tweet the hell out of the show that we just did and then next week i might still tweet somebody else's show right and promote it but that next guest is going to do that so the whole point is to bring the people in with you help them and never bring the same crowd twice and you're going to tap into each of their audiences each time and hopefully get this lift that just compounds yeah I, I like that one one thing well i'm this is something i'm trying i kind of want to get your feedback on it now <laughs> but um so i'm going back to some of my previous guests the ones that i've enjoyed talking with uh, quite a bit or you know that and they're ex accessible to do another episode with and i'm bringing so i'm bringing on several guests at once and they're people that haven't met each other before and just kind of like throwing us all into uh, one episode and just going to pick a topic and see what happens. Do you think that's also a good strategy or would you advise you. against it? Well, uh, are you thinking as a podcast or a clip episode? Uh, either, either one, really. So, so, I mean, that's kind of what clip episode is built for, right, was to grab those kinds of people. So if you look at a conference series, you know, usually it's, you know, 20 speakers, but it's 15 or the same as the last time. There's only five new ones. So, um, so I look at this as a great way to – you know, if you have that stable of people who've been on your show or you've done 200 podcast episodes or whatever, you have 180 guests that were on, um, you know, they're never, I'm never going to have time to join every one of your shows, right? I mean, I will if you do a clip episode like uh, try this, but, uh, right. but in general, like Noah Kagan, maybe on your show once, and then he'll be like, you know, you'll, you'll send him like a couple of invitations to be on these little news round tables, let's call them, that you're making with clip episode or making in your, in your, in your you know, podcast software. Um, and he won't be able to join all of them, but he'll be able to join some. And I just think that the ability to jump in in 15 to 20 stolen seconds in between doing two other really important, grueling, crappy things, but having that little break in between where I get to think of a question, I'm not going to answer it right now. I'm gonna, like, I'll think about it. And I'll, I'll sleep on it, right? An hour later, the next day, whatever, I can come back and I can answer your question. You're going to get really cool answers, and you might have somebody jump in that doesn't have time to sit down for Skype with you. So doesn't have time to come into a media company studio in LA and show up to be on a little you know show where you interview rap stars or whatever, but they could absolutely jump in from the back of a limo somewhere or you know in between something at the Grammys or somebody hands them a phone and says hey answer this question right, I think that's a really easy interesting way to get content and from a variety of guests, so that's absolutely what I built is like that way to do these news roundtables and so so you think of um, 
you know, I have a friend who's friend with uh, who's friends with a lot of like famous investors and movie stars and whatever. And if he was doing a show in this, he's not going to get Elon Musk or you know some you know I don't know um, you know Steph Curry like some famous athlete right to be on his show every you know twice a week. Not going to happen. Shaquille O'Neal not going to do his show. But do you think once a year Elon Musk might jump into his show because it's a 15 second total commitment from clicking the link, your camera turns on, you record an answer, you're Elon Musk, you don't need to do a second take, and you hit submit video and you're out, like you're done? Absolutely. So we're trying to make it very easy for you to get those people where that might be like a year 10 guest for your podcast. Right. <laughs> but how do, you, how, do you get them, how do you get them in year one or in month six? And you're not going to get Elon Musk more than once a year. But you got Elon Musk once a year, and Lady Gaga jumped in, and like these things. So, so that's what I'm kind of looking for that serendipity. But I think about that all the time. How do you? And this goes back to the Jackie Chan thing, right? You know, from like six hours ago when we started this, which was um, that whole idea of trading up. You do that with the brand equity too. So, if you um, if you can get a couple of these people to be on your show, that kind of propels your show. Then you get a few more people on your show, and at some point. You actually have the Mark Maron podcast, or you know one of you know one of the biggest you know the Tim Ferriss podcast, where now Arnold Schwarzenegger is begging to be on your show, and you don't have to beg him to be on your show, right? How do you get to that point? Well, you get to that point by getting hundreds of other people to invest a little bit of equity in you, a little bit of their you know uh, the fame equity, whatever you call it, um, as you make your way up to where now you are the brand. And now you have the power and you have the audience and you have all this stuff going, the momentum, right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, but that's exactly what I see happening. And yeah. I see happening. No, I love it, man. And I, I realize this has turned into a little bit of a marathon and I'm sure that you have other stuff on your plate today. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll kind of move us along to the what last. Are you, what are your questions? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Ready. All right. I, so I think cause I've heard some stuff, so I, I don't know if you ask the same ones every time or what. I know some people do that. Like, you know, the, the Proust questions or whatever. Yeah. Like the thing, like that. But no, what, what are yours? Yep. So I just have uh, usually three questions. I, it was like, it was five or seven or something, but then I was like, eh, I actually enjoy the normal conversation better than the, the, the questions at the end. So cool. uh, the first question to wrap up the show is, uh, do you, is there anything that you do on a daily basis that you feel like really gives you an edge or an advantage on your day? I do. And it's not a work thing. It's not working. Uh, so I take my kids to school and, uh, unless I'm out of town and then, then they, they go to school without me. They don't skip school, but, um, I take my kids to school and the thing that I do is what my, my dad's mom, my grandmother taught me. Uh, she's still alive. She's an amazing woman. I think like 90 something. We were just talking about her this morning actually with my daughter. Um, she said, you talk to your kids all the time, like explain things to them. So we will unpack lyrics. We will talk about all sorts of things. So with my daughter today, we were talking, there's a song that mentions you're sitting on a powder keg and burning the candle at both ends. And it's a beautiful song by Fastball. It's a really amazing, haunting, just gorgeous song. But they have these two phrases in the beginning. And I asked her, do you know what a powder keg is? And she's nine. And she's like, I don't know, is it a, you know, she, she thought it was like you know, baby powder. I'm like, no. And I explained what a keg is, you know, which is of course great, you know, frat parties and stuff. But then we, we go through all this stuff. So anyway, talking to your kids, explaining things to your kids, and it just gives me like those teaching moments kind of fuel me. And they're just a break from working on an app and writing investors and trying to juggle you know, talent and getting famous people to use your product and being week five in the app store and waiting for that spark, that thing to catch on. And like, is it ever going to work? Um, it's just a really nice, refreshing break knowing that I'm investing in their lives and that I'm making them better people and that they remember these things and they repeat them back to other people and I can watch them grow. So I, I thrive for that. I would, I would hate to give that up. I love taking my kids to school. That's pretty awesome, man. It's, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I, I don't, I don't, I can't say that I completely, I completely get it, but it, from what you're saying, it sounds like a, a very important part of your day that allows you to almost like center yourself. Exactly. Right. So it's very grounding, right? Like they have lives, they have stuff going on, they get sick, they don't get sick. Uh, well, think about your podcast. You know, you are giving, you are teaching, and that act of teaching means you're constantly also a student and you're constantly learning things, right? So by asking the right questions, being the person who provides the forum for that, by being the voice and the leader and educating and being a teacher, you're a perpetual student and you're constantly learning great new things and growing. So it's, uh, you know, very similar. Yeah. The uh, the main lesson I keep learning is how little I actually know. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I got a, a physics degree in college, and like when you get to the end, like you didn't master it. You just learn like you can specialize in something and still not know anything. And there are so many people out there who know much more than you do. Yes, exactly. It's a it's an incredible, incredibly humbling thing. I think some people get a degree and think they know everything. And I got a degree, and I was like, oh my god, I'm never going to be good. At this. Like, I'm never going to make make a difference, be an Einstein or whatever, or a Planck. It's not going to happen, right? Wow. Yeah, and it gives you so much more respect when you do see people doing amazing things in your field. You're just like, oh my god, right. how did you? Yeah. How did you do that? Because that. Yep. That's. I don't know if people realize how difficult what you just did was. So the the next question I have for you is, uh, do you what what would be your most impactful book or another way to Another way to phrase that would be if if you had to recommend one book someone read it could and it's the only book they read their entire life what would that book be Okay so their entire life um my god uh so I mean I you know immediately when you talked about stuff I think startup things I think crossing the chasm I think um the hard thing about hard things by Ben Horowitz that's maybe the the best one in terms of all the psychology stuff that we talked about at the beginning it's going to be hard. It's it's always going to be hard. If it wasn't hard, you wouldn't make any. You know, you, there wouldn't be these like billion dollar payouts and stuff like that, right? Like that's a really good book. The Innovator's Dilemma. There are a lot of things that talk about these these things. But man, um, I don't know. Like I, I want to go with something else, like The Alienist or Gone Girl. Like just a trashy, fun, the time tra- traveler's wife. Like I don't read a lot of fiction. I wish I read more fiction, had more time for fiction. So when I read, when it blows my mind. Like I told you, I don't read any Harry Potter stuff. <laughs> right, um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of like a fun book that's not a business book that I really enjoyed. The Checklist Manifesto, but that's like another good business book. Um, man, oh man. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. So it really is like I need to meet a person and know what they need to read next, what they need to do next. So I don't. I just don't have one. It's like um, it's like recommending a TV show for somebody. You know, The right. Shield was my favorite series ever just above everything. It was just my favorite, but it's not for everyone. And you can't say it's better than Sopranos because hmm. it's not. It just is for me. That's a really good point because it's, it depends on what your taste is, where you are in life. Because I, I uh, now, now I'm like questioning my own answer to that question because you sh- <laughs> usually my, answer? my answer is The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Okay. Right, uh, right, right. But now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, you know, what if you've already, you're already, going down that path right you're already going down the path that you're already kind of listening to your own intuition or the way that they say in the book like living your own legend you're already doing that so you know the alchemist might not be the right book at that point in time for you correct somebody Mm -hmm. else is going to say 100 percent the bible and somebody else is going to be like that is absolutely not the right thing for me (laughs) one book it's not that one right so you know i don't know ask oprah i'm not the guy to recommend books (laughs) <laughs> unless you have a specific problem and I will help you through that problem. Yeah. Just, just, tw- uh, just tweet at Brian Alvey with all of your, yeah. all of your book requests for your specific okay. problem. <laughs> all right, yes. Brian. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really glad you took the time to, to show up on the formula, uh, for this episode. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and I always enjoy talking to you. You always have, you always have something, uh, something you always say something that I, I learned from and can take away and apply to whatever I'm doing. Thanks. So I really appreciate it. Uh, the, a blast. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I hope you had fun. <laughs> uh, so the last question I have for you is, uh, what what message would you leave for our audience moving forward? You know, I'd love to say never give up, right? Be resilient. Don't. Uh, but I mean, just you know, I would say, um, wow. I mean, it, it's you know, health and happiness. I mean, they're, they're, it's very funny because they're, they're you know, all this startup junk and who got funded and who didn't and what are you doing? None of those things matter if you're unable to be happy. And a lot of people hold themselves back from being happy and you know, health factors into that. So just stay healthy and uh, find ways to be happy when the world doesn't want you to be happy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap for this week's show. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Formula. And big thanks to Brian for taking the time to sit down and chat with us this week. Now, if you think you would like or you would enjoy hearing more podcasts, uh, getting some other forms of information uh, and blog posts, guides, uh, maybe some ebooks or free online classes, go ahead and head over to helixacademy.co to sign up for our weekly newsletter. And that's a wrap for this week's show. My name is Trevor Carlson. 
and I look forward to you tuning in to our show next week. <laughs>